凡人どもよ我が名を称えよお前たちの心に地下と刻みつけるのだ暗黒の中で神の報復を待つだ消え失せろこれぞ神の力漆黒の闇そのクルスを増していく見るがいい苦しみを乗り越えたこの力を戦いに溺れようじゃないか天を遮り空を覆わハ<笑>生存か破滅かそれはもちろん破滅を選ぶさこの体に刻まれた痛みはまだ生々しい<笑>君にはもう悲惨な結末しか残されてないのさ Hello everyone, Fiala here. So once again we have another patch hitting global. And I'm just going to recap real quick what it is we're getting this time. Hopefully this will help some of you decide whether or not you want to pull on these characters. Now there is actually some uncertainty as to what's actually getting added this patch. The biggest question on people's minds is whether or not we're actually getting S behind. The strategy squad tried to ask some questions about this, but we didn't get very forthcoming answers for it. So for the purposes of this video, I'm going to go forward assuming we are getting S behind. In case we don't get him this month, we are almost certainly going to get him next month. So just consider that part a month early, I suppose. Anyway, today we're talking about Kruger and Vincent. Now, if you're somebody who keeps up with the PvP aspect of the game, you've probably already decided that you are going to be pulling on Kruger or not. But if you're still not sure, maybe stay tuned and I could talk a little bit about them. So first we have Kruger. Almost every time people talk about Kruger, a Bozo is going to get brought up. In the context of how he compares to Kruger and maybe who's better or maybe what unique aspects each of them have, it's a very appropriate comparison because the similarities between Bolzo and Kruger are pretty hard to deny. They're both in the dark and mythical factions, they're both debuff and AoE focused characters, they're both pretty annoying characters that can carry games in the right situations, and they're both pretty bulky cloth wearers, especially considering they both have the same soldiers. So Kruger does have access to things like Stone Colossus and whatnot that Bolzo also has access to. If I was to sum up their most major differences, I would put it like this. Bozel has a faction buff, he has the seal passive, and he has the sleep spell. Whereas Kruger has better damage, better support ability than Bozel, and he can actually dispel buffs. So for Kruger's damage and buff dispelling ability, you just have to look at his talent to understand. His talent makes his damage go up for every debuff that's on an enemy unit, and the debuffs don't have to be dealt by himself, so he does synergize well with other debuff characters, as you can imagine. The damage increase maxes out at 30% when you have 6 debuffs. 30% uh, is the highest we typically see on any unit. Uh, for example, Rachel, Lana, and Yulia all have 30% damage boost in their talent. Basically, so far, the only time we've seen a hero have higher than 30% damage in their talent is in special cases or with very stringent activation requirements. For example, Varash can actually get all the way up to 50% damage dealt increased, but he has kind of a troublesome activation requirement to get to that level. Kruger's 6 debuff requirement can sometimes be harder to achieve when compared to something like Yulia's HP threshold. So as with pretty much any other debuff character, you are looking to ban Rosenseal first, not only to make sure Kruger can actually debuff the enemy, but also to make sure he can get this damage boost in his talent. So the second part of his talent is an extra random debuff at the end of any attack, and is structured very similar to Bozel where the chance of it happening increases with his star level. And in fact, he has the same debuff pool here as Bozel, which is the Black Hole debuff pool. The key difference here is that Kruger removes one buff from the enemy and then turns it into a debuff. Uh, so this does mean that Kruger is actually an AoE buff stripping character. So even in cases where you feel like a debuff strategy won't be very effective, Kruger still adds some value to your team because he's removing buffs from your opponent. But again, since he does need to inflict debuffs in order to get the damage in his talent, it's still highly recommended that you first ban Rosenseal if you plan on using Kruger. So as far as his skill kick goes, it's pretty much what you expect out of a character like this. He has a lot of the standard scary debuffs, like Black Hole, and some other minor AoEs like Forget and whatnot that you probably won't use very often. So I'll just go into detail for some of his more unique skills. So first you have this 2 cost AoE he has called Midnight Feast. This skill is a 5 span self-centered AoE. But I would actually compare its effect a little bit to something like Young Jessica's 3 cost skill, because not only does it damage the opponent and deal one random debuff, it actually buffs your allies within range as well. It increases the damage they do and also make it so that if they attack in single target, 
uh, they will heal back after attacking, so kind of similar to Rosalia's sword in that sense. As you can imagine, this is especially nice for rush teams. Damages all your opponents and then makes your rush more effective by making them do more damage and also helping them keep healthy. So just a very powerful AoE and you're going to see him using this very often. I also feel the need to point out that this unit has Dark Reaper. As I said before, Kruger's damage potential is much higher than Bozel's, so his Dark Reaper is actually very very scary because not only can he get 30% damage from his talent, he also has 20% attack boost for his soldiers as opposed to Bozel who only has 10%. And like most top tier mage heroes, he has access to sorceresses. So it's not going to be seen super often, but it is something worth noting that Kruger's single target damage can still be very scary. He also has a skill that is an HP shield. So this is an actual HP shield, it actually adds an extra bit of health onto the target's life bar. As of this recording, this is still an effect that is entirely unique to Kruger. He can of course buff himself with this, but since it has 3 range, it can actually be used in a number of ways. For example, you can use it to protect your tank, or you can use it to protect another squishy unit from getting assassinated. Uh, this skill is also an act against skill, so after he uses it, he can move two blocks and attack. So thanks to this skill, Kruger usually has a better movement range than Bozel as well. The final skill I want to point out here is his 3 cost skill. So this is a skill that switches back and forth, similar to Sigma's 3 cost skill. The first part of this skill targets one enemy, and makes it so that any time that unit ends their turn, they will deal 3 random debuffs to 3 allies within 3 blocks, and this includes the tagged unit themselves. Now it should be noted that the debuff list from this first part of his 3C is actually a pretty weak debuff list. It only does 10% attack or defense debuff, 15% uh, magic defense debuff, 10% damage taken, and damage dealt minus 10%. You're not going to see Kruger inflicting heal block or buff block from all the way across the map, uh, but just the fact that Kruger can cast this from anywhere in the map is pretty powerful in and of itself. And of course one of the main functions of this is to not only debuff your enemy a little bit before they even engage you, but also to start setting up Kruger's talent, because again, he needs debuffs in order for his talent to work. The second part of the skill is another self-target 5 range AoE. Uh, the effect is basically the black hole effect, it's just that the targeting is a little bit different. Uh, it also has an inbuilt cooldown reduction if you hit enough enemies. So overall you can see that Kruger is another very strong debuff character to add into the game. He has a couple interesting bells and whistles that other debuff characters do not have. Uh, I will say that me personally, I don't think he's quite as ridiculous as Reen for the simple fact that he does not have uh, Curse of Wounding in his debuff list. Uh, he's still very scary, he can still carry games just like Volzo can. But I will say he's not some crazy power creep beyond adding another character you have to ban if you really hate dealing with debuffs. Of course, if you yourself are a debuff player, I don't think you need me to tell you that Kruger is absolutely a must-pull for you. If you are a newer player, or if you're a PvE main, I personally would say that Kruger is not very essential at all. The unique skills he has compared to Bozel are more useful in PvP compared to PvE. Bozel is just a lot more useful in PvE, and I don't think Kruger is going to take that away from him. I think the value of Bozel being able to sleep enemies is pretty self-explanatory, and so is his ability to faction buff. Uh, now, Kruger can be very good in Fenrir, uh, he can do a lot of damage just like Bozo can, and his shield can help prevent people from dying to the map-wide AoEs. But I think most people have a pretty well-built Fenrir team at this point, and it's actually kind of hard to fit Kruger in, I think. The biggest problem with Kruger is actually his bond requirements. He requires Shalinka for his defense bond, uh, which I guess is arguably not that essential, uh, but up to this point, Shalinka has not been run out of Destiny Banner. She will be in a very far-off banner, but that's so many months from now. We should be getting a Shalinka banner later this month, but it is not a Destiny banner, so those of you who don't have Shalinka and you're planning on trying to get both Kruger and Shalinka, I hope you all have a lot of crystals stored up because it's not going to be easy on you. That's all I have to say about Kruger for now, so let's talk about Vincent. Vincent wasn't super popular on the Chinese server, but that's not because he's bad. Most people just decided they didn't really want to spend the Gate of Fates on him, when compared to some of the other essential characters that people are probably sharding at this point, such as Himiko, Kruger, and probably Hilda still. Vincent is a pure AoE damage character. I don't think there's a lot of interesting details to be said about this unit. His talent increases his AoE damage and also says that when he dies, he will actually do damage to everybody around him. Uh, most of his skill kit really isn't that interesting, so I'm going to jump right into talking about his 3 cost and how that synergizes with his talent. So first, his 3 cost skill has a passive that gives him a revive, and this revive also activates his on death self-destruct talent once. It also has an active portion that has 4 range and pulls him to the enemy before doing an AoE. So just from this you can tell already that Vincent's playstyle is a little bit similar to AoE Ares. Being a flyer he has 5 movement and he has an extra 4 range on top of that. 
So he has a pretty nice striking distance. So usually how it would go with Vincent is that you use his 3 cost to pull him over to your opponent. It does an AoE. Now this skill actually makes Vincent damage himself for 30% of his life. But it also removes all of his debuffs and makes him immune to all debuffs. So now that Vincent is in your opponent's face and he just did an AoE, your opponent is faced with something of a dilemma. If he tries to kill Vincent, then Vincent will just explode and do more damage from his talent. And of course he'll revive once, so if they kill him again, he'll just explode again. Now of course they could just try to ignore him if they want to, but that means that Vincent next turn is going to get an opportunity to fire off his other AoE and do even more damage. So overall Vincent is just a pure AoE damage character that's very troublesome to deal with. And of course, since he's immune to all debuffs after he uses his 3 cost, you can't just do things like try to sleep him or try to passive block him. His kit is very much designed around kamikaze and, and just giving you something very annoying to deal with. Now of course, since Vincent is an AoE character without any debuffs to speak of, he's pretty easily stopped by Juggler or even Rosenseal. So that is one of the troubles with pure AoE damage characters like Vincent. But since Vincent is in the Meteor, Empire, and Dark factions, he synergizes very well with a lot of characters that can either AoE alongside him or take advantage of the lowered HP from his AoEs. I think the Dark faction is self-explanatory. Uh, he can't do any debuffs, but his allies sure can. Uh, Empire is going to be getting a bit of a resurgence with Bernhard coming back. And Empire has a lot of really strong AoE characters that can be run alongside both Bernhard and Vincent. So of course Bernhardt's Sword Dance can be used as a setup for the other AoE characters like Vincent, but of course you have options like Leonhardt, Clotaire, and even units like Egbert or Olivier. These are all really great AoE characters in Empire. And finally, Meteor Strike doesn't go into AoEs very much, but AoEs are always helpful for assassins because you can break glass rights and break other 100% HP effects to set up kills from assassins. But generally speaking, I do think you're going to see Vincent more at home with the Dark or Empire factions. As for Vincent's PvE performance, is really nothing special. He of course can provide a lot of AoE damage on any maps where you think that might be useful, and he has okay single target potential because he has 25% attack boost on his soldiers, but because his talent doesn't offer any damage or attack power to his soldiers, his single target damage is still going to be very lacking. Add to that the fact that his bonds are Elusia and Kruger, neither of whom are popular PvE characters to pull. I really cannot recommend pulling for Vincent if you are a more PvE-focused player. And again for PvP, Vincent is not quite as immediately useful as someone like Himiko or Kruger, which is why you're probably not going to see as much of him compared to some of those other characters, but you would be very mistaken to underestimate his potential for AoE damage. If you die really often to AoE strategies, better be careful with this guy. So now let's talk a little bit about the three cost skills they're adding. First we have Varash. Varash's 3 cost is kind of boring. Uh, it does fix a number of weaknesses that he had. The passive prevents him from wasting a bunch of lives to things like mirror armor. I think I would have really preferred for this to just have been a straight immunity to fix damage. Uh, Varash is kind of an underpowered character, so I don't feel like that would have been too OP for him. Uh, but whatever, it is what it is, I guess. The attack portion of this 3 cost is basically just Aqua Blast. Uh, that's actually not too bad, because Aqua Blast has always been a very good skill anyway. He can alternate this with his normal Aqua Blast, and since the passive says he's always treated as being on water now, he's always going to be doing 2 times damage with his attacks. So once you get Varash into his Berserk mode, he can be quite a nuisance and do a lot of damage. But overall, this one's just okay. Now, Knight of Mysteries 3 cost is pretty interesting. I feel like this skill will shift her more over to being an AoE character. And as far as the Legend faction goes, do consider the fact that they just got Himiko. So if you have a Legend box with units like Shelfanil, Himiko, Rachel, or even Lambda, uh, Knight of Mysteries is going to be able to contribute to that AoE damage quite a bit. It used to be that if you wanted to run Knight of Mystery as an AoE character, you had to use Thunder Zone and then probably had to use something like Forget, which is kind of unimpressive. You could also consider doing things like maybe running a Mage Knight of Mystery with a Miracle Staff. Uh, you can also do a couple funny things like maybe you can put the Goblin Knights on Knight of Mystery and let her steal some buffs. And of course Knight of Mystery can still provide her strong single target damage if you need it. So I do think this is a pretty interesting 3 cost in terms of the options it provides you for how to use Knight of Mystery. It's not going to suddenly make her super meta again. But I do think she was always a good character, even if she's fallen out of the meta a little bit. And those of you in love with the Legend faction can maybe consider playing around with Knight of Mystery again a little bit. So finally we have Close. Personally I feel like so far, Zalone still hasn't made any missteps as far as healer 3Cs go. Imelda got a really good 3C, uh, Iris' 3C is pretty good too, and this one that Close I got is really good too. 
So this skill emphasizes Gose's role as a mass dispeller kind of healer. The passive portion of this 3C makes it so that every single heal she does will have an extra tiny AoE heal attached to it that also dispels one debuff. And then it has an active portion which is just a really good heal. 3 times int heal doesn't seem like a lot but the other effects are pretty crazy. First off the range is really big, it has 5 spaces around Close. And if you're right next to her she will activate the passive portion and then heal you again for 1 times intelligence. It also makes your subsequent heals stronger, so pretty nice for fighting against AoE enemies. Uh, but perhaps most importantly is that this skill actually dispels debuffs before healing. So this means if you have Curse of Wounding, you have Heal Block. When you cast this, it actually removes that first and then heals you. In a vacuum, that makes this one of the strongest heals available when fighting against debuff opponents. But there are a couple of weaknesses to this 3C and some of them are just problems that Close has always had. So first, this skill has a 5 turn cooldown. And alongside Aurora Rings, 4 turn cooldown, uh, if you decide to use both of these, that means Close is going to have a lot of downtime after using both of them. And the problem with this has always been that you can't clock heals. Your opponent can clock Black Hole over and over, but you can't clock Close's heals. Now, you can use this 3 cost alongside Mass Heal, and that might work sometimes, since the passive on this means that you can heal for more and remove more debuffs with Mass Heal. Uh, but since Close doesn't have access to Forest Priest, that means her, uh, a Mass Heal with this. 3 cost passive is only about as strong as a mass heal from Wheeler, and even Almeida might have a stronger mass heal. Finally, one last problem I have with this 3 cost is that it kind of totally discards Close's off DPS potential. So when people use Close a lot more back in Season 1 and 2, one of the nice things about her was that you could always bring Faith plus Discipline on her and she would be able to do some decent amount of damage. Uh, she had Phalanx and Zealot, so she did a pretty good job fighting Cav Landiuses, otherwise she could attack from range if she had to. Not to mention that she was one of the bulkier healers due to her access to last rites. But this 3 cost does not synergize well with her discipline set at all. You can still bring it, it just doesn't work that well with it. Uh, but despite these weaknesses, I still think this is a pretty good 3 cost. It might even be nice for some PvE situations. And if nothing else, it can save you from the World Arena turn 1 Sakura kill uh, without having to equip Gaia's Heart on your juggler or whatever. Overall, it's pretty good. So next let's take a look at the two new exclusive items they added. On the Chinese server this helm didn't really save Tsubame from obscurity, but I do think part of the reason for that is that people were too busy sharding characters that are overall more effective than Tsubame is. That being said, I think this is overall a pretty good helm. The extra damage and the extra crit rate is of course welcome. Of course this still means that Tsubame is mostly a crit reliant assassin, which means if you want to use her you should probably ban Hilda. But more importantly this exclusive actually gives Tsubame a special buff that increases her movement. So since she can get up to plus 2 movement from this helm, this means that she can now have 3 plus 2 movement, 5 movement base, and then you can use Quick Step in her skill kit to give her another 2 movement. So effectively she'll have 7 move with 2 attack range, which I think is pretty in line with the other assassins. And of course, Tsumari's hiding ability still allows her to approach her enemy a little bit more brazenly than the other assassins, depending on how you pick Ban of course. So I do think it does fix somewhat Tsubame's biggest problem, was that her range was lower than most assassins, or at least the top tier assassins like Zerda or even Sigma. I think the main reason this didn't really make Tsubame suddenly shoot up in usage is because, yeah it fixed her movement issues, but the rest of her kit is not super interesting or special. She'll do her job just fine and she'll be a threat as much as any assassin I think. I don't think this is going to make anybody go out of their way to shard Tsubame if they didn't already do so. Next we have Gerald and Layla's weapon. As is expected for units like Gerald and Layla who are mixed attack int characters, uh, this hammer has both attack and int. And of course this also increases the hero's normal attack range by one. Uh, so it's very obvious that they created this hammer to fix one of the biggest issues with Gerald and Layla's 3C, which is if you brought sorceresses and you used the 3C, you would turn into Gerald, and you would be able to use Holy Word at two range alongside the Sorks, but then after that, Gerald is stuck at 1 range and the Sorks are 2 range, uh, and Zalone I guess is really dumb and didn't spend 5 minutes trying to figure out how to make his 3C work properly. So here's an exclusive that fixes that problem for you. So basically it's a stronger Gift of Eternal Life that also makes sure that Gerald can always attack at 2 range with the Sorceresses. Obviously this is just what Gerald and Layla needed, but I do think it's kind of silly that they had to wait until their special equipment to be able to do that. When before this weapon existed, their 3C was nearly unusable. Outside of like that one month when it was first released, when it was really powerful. Uh, but whatever case, if you were a Gerald and Layla fan, <laughs> this is a good hammer. It's their best weapon. Easily so. I'm just a little bit salty it took them this long to fix a problem that really should never have been one with the character in the first place. 
So thanks, Zalone. All right, with that out of the way, let's talk about SP Hein. So like I said at the beginning of the video, I don't know for sure whether or not Hein is coming this month or next month. There seems to be a bit of uncertainty right now because they've shuffled some of the events around. Uh, but I suppose in a few hours from now, all of us will probably know whether or not SP Hein is coming or not, because if the Dimensional Expedition is opening, that means we will be able to get SP Hein. And if it's not, then we won't get him. So what I think they tried to do with SP Hein here is that they tried to power up his existing kit while also keeping intact his original playstyle, which is where you have to wait around for him to get some stacks of his talent before he can really use him at full power. Now he still uses the gain knowledge stacks that he did in his original talent, in his new talent, but in his new talent he automatically gets two stacks of gain knowledge at the start of a map if he's at six stars. So they shorten the amount of time he needs to cap out his intelligence, uh, but they actually also added new types of stacks into his talent so that his core gameplay stays the same, where you need to have Hein sit around and charge up before he can use some of his best skills. So these two new types of stacks are Thunder and Fire stacks. These also stack up to four each, just like his gain knowledge stacks, and you actually do start the map with two of each of these. So it's not like SP Hein is useless at the start of the map. He can still be useful even starting at turn one. His main kit is probably going to be his two new skills plus his three cost skill. And the reason for that becomes fairly obvious once you read these two new skills that he gets. So first he gets a one cost skill that is basically a cold blood style skill where he gets to move two extra blocks. But more importantly, this one cost skill has a passive that powers up his three cost skill, making it deal 50% more damage and also deal fixed damage equal to one times Hein's intelligence. And since Hein has really, really high intelligence thanks to his gain knowledge stacks, uh, that fixed damage is nothing to shake a stick at. Now, the multiplier on his 3 cost has always been kind of bad, but the 50% increased damage does help out uh, quite a bit. And of course, Hein's 3 cost skill also creates some terrain effects. It's not a super useful terrain effect, but it is nice to be able to overwrite other terrain effects, if nothing else. Uh, this 1 cost skill also gives Hein a magic shield, which lowers damage from a magic attack once. Uh, I mean, it's not super useful, but it might save you once in a while. So the second new skill that Hein gets is actually a selection skill. It is three skills in one, so it's very strong just from that alone. Uh, however, this is the skill that is limited by his new Thunder and Fire stacks. So one of the skills costs two of his Fire and Thunder stacks, and one of the skills costs four of his Thunder stacks, and one of the skills costs four of his Fire stacks. Uh, so as you can imagine, since he starts the map with two of Fire and Thunder, he can use the Teleport skill immediately. Uh, this is obviously useful because turn 1 teleport strats is something that people do quite a bit in PvP. That skill alone gives Hein a lot of value to some boxes. The teleport also increases the damage dealt by that unit by 10%. So it's not quite as powerful as Iris's teleport, but it's pretty good considering all the other things that Hein can offer to a team. Uh, the other two skills are basically it's an AoE and a single target, so one of them is basically Meteor and one of them is basically Lightning Strike. Uh, now both of these are stronger than their respective normal versions, so to speak. The Meteor spell has a slightly higher multiplier on its AoE damage, and the new Thunder spell is not only does it do 1.6 times damage, which is slightly higher than the normal Lightning Strike, but it also increases soldier range by 1. So basically this lets Hein attack from 3 range with the Lightning spell, or 4 range if he has the range staff. So essentially what they gave us behind here is a grab bag of a lot of different skills from different characters. He's got a bit of increased range like some other mages, he's got a teleport spell, he's got some good AoE potential as well. Overall, Hein remains a pretty straightforward DPS character, but he's definitely a pretty good one now. He's not going to reach the heights of some of the crazy mages like, say, uh, Tenzei Jessica or Lucretia. But considering how almost everybody has a 6-star Hein sitting around, sure the upgrade cost can be a little bit steep, but there's a pretty good unit waiting for you that you can upgrade without having to disrupt upgrading other units via Gate of Fates. Hein's been a fan favorite within the franchise for a while, so it kind of sucks that he was sidelined before this. Uh, this upgrade isn't going to make him quite as OP as he was in the original Langrisser 2, but it's definitely a really nice upgrade and worth considering if you feel like you need another mage in your box and you think you can fit Hein in there. So before I finish off this video talking about the new content they're about to add, I'll just mention real quick this equipment banner that we should be getting this month. Now, when this equipment banner ran on the Chinese server, they actually had an event alongside this which essentially was a sparking system. Once you pulled 120 times, you were allowed to choose one piece of your choice. Now, for a lot of you low-budget players, you're probably going to be too busy pulling for Kruger and maybe Shalinka later on to be able to spare any tickets for this banner. But if you're like me and you're considering skipping Kruger for whatever reason, then maybe you can consider looking into this equipment banner. Or if you're a well, I guess this is a nice bonus for you as well. 
I will say that one advantage this equipment banner has over almost every past equipment banner is that all four pieces this time are good. So first you have this cloth helm that heals you a little bit and also prevents you from dying from fixed damage once. Now since this is a cloth helm, it is immediately in competition with Tenyo's headdress and that can always be hard to give up, but this helm does have a couple perks for it that Tenyo's helm does not have. First, the pre-battle heal is really nice for countering Twilight Star. Twilight Star users usually don't do that much damage with the fixed damage itself, so this should be able to heal you back up, back to 100% if you need it to defend yourself against something. But 10% is probably not enough to save you against backstab, so you probably still need to wear Bracer or Med Ring if you want to protect yourself from backstab. Uh, but it's definitely an interesting option for some of the last rights wearers or maybe some of the Shrine Manian users. In addition, reviving from fixed damage once is actually very useful considering some of the units that we're going to be seeing more of. For example, this can let you survive Bernhardt's Rupture Sword Dance. It can maybe let you live through an unlucky Reen, Termination slash Fixed Damage Tick, maybe save you against a Blood Dance from Lestelle for a few times you still run into her. And of course this helm also has base 10% HP just like Tenyo's Headdress does, so you're not giving up anything in terms of base stats. Overall, Tenyo's Headdress is still kind of OP and hard to replace, but there's definitely a couple interesting builds you can do with this, especially if you're a type of player that likes to play a more stable game and doesn't like to rely too much on your Tenyo's Headdress activations. Uh, for example, if you put this on Yulia, she can arguably get rid of her Med Ring and instead go with something like Holy Ring or even something like Dimensional Jewel. I think there's just a lot of options being opened by this helm that you otherwise wouldn't be able to really use within the current meta. Next you have this sword. Uh, this is arguably the weakest item out of this new banner, uh, but it's still pretty nice because it's pretty much a straight upgrade to Seal Guardian uh, for the units that still like using a sword to tank bust. Uh, for example, it's nice on Rosalia. You can stick it on just about any infantry unit and it's pretty good there. You do lose the defensive bulk compared to Seal Guardian, so if you value that then you probably still want to stick to Seal Guardian, uh, but otherwise, pretty good sword. This accessory they're adding is basically a Slayer's Emblem except it's for Cavalry. Uh, I don't know why they feel the need to nerf Cavalry even more than they already have, uh, but there it is, just screwing over Horse Landiuses and roll the Cavalry even more. You can also try sticking this on some infantry heroes and try to mitigate some of that class disadvantage, uh, but you're definitely going to still be at a disadvantage because the, because the class advantage multiplier is much much higher than this attack plus 12% is going to be able to make up for. And of course you're still going to have the defensive weakness as well. Finally, there's this armor, which is basically a halfway point between Bloodline Magic Armor and Aeolus Armor. I do think this armor is really good, but for some units I think they're still going to prefer using Bloodline or Aeolus because they have a specific type of attack they're weak against. For example, Albedo is probably still going to stick to Aeolus Armor because she has a little bit more trouble against ranged attacks, especially mage ones, and Landius is probably going to stick with Bloodline Magic Armor as opposed to this one because uh, he has no melee reduction and plenty of range reduction to work with already. Uh, it's also worth remembering that this is a 5% HP loss since it gives 5% defense magic defense instead of 5% HP defense like Aeolus and Bloodline give. It's an interesting side grade piece for sure, and I think it works really well on units like Leiden or Emilia and even Freya. Uh, even though usually the Freyas are going to be wearing last rights, I do think this has a place as well. And I don't think this is a bad piece to wear on your DPS either. Also the sprite looks cool. That's always important. So I'll wrap this up by talking a little bit about the new events we're getting this time. So first of course we have 100% confirmed that we are getting the roguelike mode returning. So overall, this mode was pretty well received on both the Chinese and the global server. I do think one of the complaints that came out of both communities was that the mode was a little bit too easy. Especially once you figured out some of the ways you could cheese the mode. So this time what they're going to do is that they're actually going to give us two sets of levels, with the second set of levels essentially being a hard mode. The first set of stages we're getting is pretty much the same as last time, relatively easy, you get plenty of resources to finish the mode. But in the second set of stages, uh, not only do you have to start over from scratch, but you're going to be offered less heroes, you're going to be given very few chances to reset your progress or revive your characters, and in general the enemies just scale up faster. Uh, it's not all just trying to punish us though, because they have added a new mechanic, which is essentially a party passive skill. Uh, for example, one of the ones is going to say something like, if you have four holy units at the same time, you're, all of your units have increased stats. So they've added an interesting aspect to the party building this time, uh, which is when you are offered three different characters, you might choose one that wasn't your first choice just because you want their class to line up with certain other classes in your team. Uh, but otherwise, the mode is largely the same. Lots of nice rewards up for grabs, uh, but you do have to pay a little bit more attention this time if you want to be able to clear all the stages. Now, of course, just like SB Hine, I'm not sure if they're going to be adding the Dimensional Expedition this month, but if it doesn't come this month, it's almost certainly going to come next month. Uh, like I said, Strategy Squad tried asking, but the devs were a little tight-lipped about it, so uh, we're just going to have to see, and we're going to know very soon. 
If you want to know more about the Dimensional Expedition, I actually made a separate video about that, and it's probably the most viewed video on this channel. So chances are you've already seen it, but hey, shameless plug and all that. Anyway, that's all I gotta say about this patch. I try my best to keep these recap videos a bit shorter if I can, but they still end up being 30 minutes long. But as always, if you have any questions, just ask below. Uh, but until next time, good luck on your polls!